Salt. You don't have a wife, that's why you're buying that much. <laughs> I don't have, yeah. <laughs> he has no oversight. <laughs> None whatsoever. It's dangerous. It's very <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> when you're a photographer with no wife, no kids, and no other hobbies. Hello there. I think it's been about four, five months shooting with this camera now for this review, and I think it's finally long enough. I think I'd like to go home now. My first real professional camera was a Panasonic GH3. I guess you can say I've been looking for a hybrid beast since day one. Throughout the years, I craved larger sensors to match my insatiable appetite for image quality chasing a threshold only I would probably ever notice. Until I said YOLO and got a GFX 100S. Then I spent over a year documenting my professional and personal assignments all over the world in hopes of making a comprehensive review of the camera. But if I'm being honest, I got bored and burnt out and cared more about making money. The review never saw the light of day. I had nothing nice to say other than I really enjoyed the final results. They were worth it. And those 16-bit files? They're like a cheat code in a video game. You get unlimited health and ammo, and suddenly you find yourself playing just to see how you can break it. I'll let you know if I get there. Is it excessive? Maybe. It is just a tool. But if it encourages a commitment to your craft, then it's money well spent. It also helps that my only dependent is a dog who doesn't judge me. But this camera is slow and buggy and often frustrating. Tethering issues in front of your client are not the vibe, as the kids say. Photography is as much about the shooting experience as it is about the final image. Otherwise, we might as well just hang out in mid-journey. I found myself shooting with my smaller, less expensive Canon and Fuji cameras because they made my life easier and reluctantly dragged the GFX along when I knew I wanted no compromise on image quality. I contemplated selling it, but then Fuji asked, what if you no longer had to compromise? What if you could have it all? What more is there to say about that? So we are here in this amazing, incredible, architecturally significant house in Malibu uh, to test out these various cameras. And got to thank my buddy Arturo for hooking it up with the access. He's actually in there right now, actually working. Meanwhile, I'm out here just playing and goofing off and getting shots for my portfolio and for you guys for this review. And today I am testing uh, the Fuji GFX 100S II. Uh, that's a mouthful. The Canon C70, which is filming me over here, the R5C, Arturo's Red Komodo X, and his Fuji XHS2, 2S, XH2S, one of the crop sensor ones that's like for cinema. 
My initial impression is that this test is kind of pointless <laughs> because I think they're all going to perform pretty damn good and probably equally. I don't really think there's going to be much of a significant difference between the dynamic range, the color, the capacity of the files to push the grade in any one direction. Really, I'm just doing this for you nerds out there because in my opinion, any one of these cameras is going to give you an amazing image. I think really what the difference is going to come down to is a matter of your personal workflow, how you prefer it, and the functionality of the camera as far as like how much of a pain in the ass is it to shoot with or how easy it is to shoot with. Let's wrap up this intro and uh, let's get to the testing. Okay, so I was wrong, sort of. There is definitely a noticeable difference in how the files handle in post, but all of these cameras have plenty of data to work with, and I'm confident with enough tweaking I can get them all to look how I want. The RED and the C70 in RAW are nearly indistinguishable and take the lead in terms of dynamic range, but the Fuji GFX 102 is barely a step behind them. F-Log2 has an insane amount of dynamic range. The 10-bit ProRes files pack more than enough data to manipulate in post, and I actually found it easier to grab a clean key of the water and the sky in the background on the GFX, which surprised me as I was expecting the RAW from the RED and C70 to perform better there. The Canon R5C performed the worst, and it just cannot keep up in dynamic range but in a vacuum, it still holds up well and produces beautiful images. There are just levels to this. The lack of C-Log2 really holds it back here. To further demonstrate the prowess of the Fuji files, let's jump over really quick to downtown LA for a quick demo. I completely screwed up the white balance from this shot, resulting in one very blue image. Not only was I able to bring the shot back, but I was able to grade it as I intended it to look when I first shot it, and it was quite effortless. Seriously, who needs raw? And yeah, I replaced this guy because I'm extra like that. Okay, let's see how good the Fuji face tracking does while I go over this segment. I have it on the normal autofocus mode continuous uh, autofocus, face tracking, eye tracking enabled. Uh, there's some leaves here, there's some rope here, so plenty of things to potentially distract it. Uh, let's see if it recognizes my face and it holds it. So the video stuff aside, uh, the image quality of this camera, either in video or stills, is phenomenal. And on the still side, I have to say that it's been a joy to use it. There's a lot to be said for the faster readout speeds, the overall improvements to the camera's processing, and just overall responsiveness. Not just the autofocus, but everything. Like the GFX 100S always felt a half second slow. Every push of the button, every change of the menu, every snap of the shutter just felt a little laggy. It never felt instantaneous the way that full frame cameras like the Canon R5 do which to me the Canon R5 is like the best all-around camera and the GFX 102 gets there it, it's like right behind it I wouldn't say it's on par with the Canon but the user experience is significantly improved it is night and day and it's such a joy to use that the camera just doesn't get in your way. It doesn't, it's no longer an obstacle. You no longer fight with it. And if I'm no longer fighting with my GFX in front of my client, then that alone means that this upgrade was worth it. Okay, so I just finished shooting my first, what I would call professional photo with this camera because up until now, I've just kind of been hand holding it, taking more snapshots. But the photos that I just took right now were more in line with the kind of workflow that I would do on an actual professional job. And the first, uh, I guess, comments, observations, little quirks that I've noticed is that 
if you're going to use flash on this camera, specifically a Godox flash, I don't know if any other brands of flashes have the same issue, but with Godox flashes, when you put the flash trigger on the hot shoe, the viewfinder just goes completely blank. There's nothing, there's no workaround. There's nothing you can do about it. Like if you have a flash trigger from Godox on this camera, you have no viewfinder and that sucks. Like that is actually really annoying. So the best thing you could do to work around it is to compose your shot and then put the, the trigger on until somebody, either Fuji or Godox, releases a firmware update. Most of the time, I'm tethering, so this isn't a total deal breaker anyway. I'm just not tethering right now because I didn't feel like setting it up. But if you are somebody who needs to use the viewfinder while using flash, specifically Godox flashes, this might be a real serious issue. I can imagine if you're shooting fashion, if you're shooting portraits like outdoors, environmental portraits, or you're just in the flow and you want to get into the momentum and you rely on the on the viewfinder, this is gonna <laughs> this is gonna annoy you. I didn't plan to go too deep into photo quality because I wasn't expecting a dramatic improvement from its predecessor. I mean how much can one really say about resolution? I haven't conducted any nerdy testing myself, but there is a noticeable improvement to dynamic range to my eye. The clean shadow recovery makes it a breeze to blend multiple exposures when mixing flash and ambient layers, and Fuji's colors are always top of the class. And while I'm not one to normally shoot with baked in profiles in stills or video, Fuji's film emulations are the only ones from any manufacturer that I actually like. So I'll likely be a little less OCD and trust the camera a bit more when shooting with the intention of a quick turnaround like social media stories. Long gone are the days when photographers did everything in their power to keep their ISO as low as possible to prevent noise. And this camera is no exception. I get insanely clean images even at up to ISO 1600 and regularly live around 640. And the improvements in the stabilization give a further boost to squeeze as much light as possible from the sensor. Shooting at twilight is a breeze. It's great for my line of work because I can travel with much smaller strobes when going overseas. When it comes down to it, this is the best photo quality you're going to get without dropping some serious cash for a phase one system. I just hope your computer can handle it because these files are massive. So I'm using Arturo's vlog camera because I'm a dummy and I left my lav mics at home. So we're gonna have to sync this in post, which sucks because I was really hoping to test the preamps and apologies if this audio sucks. We don't have any headphones either to monitor it. So I'm gonna touch on the video capabilities so far, my initial impressions of the camera. Just right off the bat, the image looks lovely. It's a beautiful image. It's a very unique image, as you can tell. Look at the fall off behind me. I am shooting at 1.7 on the 55 millimeter lens. And it's just got this very unique separation from the background and the subject. Right now, I am testing the, the boost mode on the IBIS, which is meant for static handheld shots. I want to see how good it is at, at keeping the camera steady. Damn, though. <laughs> I'm at 2.8 right now. I need it at, at this focal length, which is like a 40. It's so f***ing shallow. Like, this sensor is so fucking big. Like, the fall off, it's like really sharp and then just a razor thin depth of field and everything just gets obliterated in the background. A shallow depth of field has become synonymous with the medium format look. And now we're gonna see it adopted into video as this is the first medium format camera to be taken seriously for motion. This shot here was taken on the 80 mm 1.7, which is about a 60 mm focal length in full frame terms. And that's just insane because I feel like I'm getting the kind of separation reserved for an 85 millimeter on a full frame system. What makes this look so unique is the ability to do it at wider focal lengths, even when you're not trying. The following shots were taken on the C70 in the GFX. I'm using the RF 50 millimeter 1.2 at about 1.8 on the Canon, which gives it a focal range of about 75 millimeters. The Fuji has the 55 1.7, which is approximately 40 millimeters equivalent. This is a subjective look, and I have no interest in throwing fuel into the fire about what constitutes a cinematic look. You will find examples of deep and shallow focus across a variety of Hollywood films, 
And my personal take is that it's just a tool in a box of looks and you use it according to the story and the emotion you're looking to extract from your audience. And speaking of unique and subjective looks, you wanna make sure that you lower the, the noise and the sharpness in camera as low as they go, the noise reduction and the sharpness, because I think it looks a little too crunchy, too digital otherwise, and it's just not the most pleasant thing. I think um, once you make those adjustments, the image is gonna look a lot more cinematic, so to speak. I really wish Fuji would have let us further reduce in-camera sharpening. And this is coming from someone who normally prefers a more detailed image. But even I think this is excessive. Granted, I am using stills lenses, which are optimized for maximum detail. And the 55mm lens I've been using for a lot of the shots in this review is probably the sharpest lens Fuji has ever made. I imagine many people will use cinema lenses with a bit more character to soften the look a bit and some further diffusion either through filters or in post-production with plugins like Scatter. But my god, is this video footage sharp as hell. Of course, all the detail in the world won't mean a thing if your shots are out of focus. I need to do a lot more testing before I draw more definitive conclusions about the autofocus system and experiment with the different sensitivity settings. Some lenses work better than others. The 80 and 55mm ones are pretty slow. However, the camera does an excellent job of detecting faces and objects, and it does understand what you're trying to track. I wouldn't use it for any elaborate focus pools or fast-moving subjects, but it will stick to your subject and hold on to a face. I also messed around a bit with the new AI subject detection feature. Again, the 55mm lens is probably not the best lens to pair with this feature. However, it did recognize my dog and kept up with her when she moved slowly but it did start hunting erratically as soon as she got excited. So this is probably not gonna be the best system to take with you on a safari, but for candid shots of your pets, it'll get the job done. Now excuse me for a second while I reward someone for being a very good girl. And speaking of speed, the faster buffer and burst rate creates new opportunities not previously possible on medium format systems. I now have the freedom to fire away when I'm trying to catch that one perfect moment in the frame instead of trying to just time it. More than anything else, this improvement shrinks the gap in performance with full frame systems. Of course, not all is perfect. The lack of customizable buttons simultaneously, which is to say that you are kind of stuck with the functions that you assign these buttons to with whatever menu you're in. So if you're in the photo menu, but you assign the video feature in the video menu, you're not gonna have that button free and disposable to assign a further photo feature. Like it's either one or the other, you're stuck with them. Canon, on the other hand, allows you to customize all of the buttons depending on the menu that you're in. So when you're in video mode, you have all of your video features at your fingertips. And then when you go to photo mode, it's the same thing. Fuji, if you're listening, I'm sure you can fix this with a firmware update. So. Please, please do it. The other thing, which again, Fuji, if you're listening, um, it's great. Thank you for giving us waveform and proper exposure tools in video, but they take up the entire LCD when you activate them, which means that you have to pick between uh, composing your shot or uh, observing your exposure because it just takes up the entire LCD screen and you can't really see what you're shooting. Those are really the little things that kind of make it annoying uh, from a production standpoint. And obviously, if you're going to go for like a real production environment, there's no SDI, but it is full HDMI, which is more than Canon can say, because the R5C still has that bullshit micro HDMI or whatever the f The stabilization is another huge improvement, and I am happy to say that the eight stops work as advertised. I was not a fan of it in the GFX 100S and rarely use that camera off a tripod but I will happily fire handheld all day on the 102 with confidence in stills. Video works very well too, though I noticed that it's best used to try to keep the camera steady, paired with the boost mode that you can assign a button to. This will prompt the camera to do its best to hold the shot like a tripod. The stabilization is also very effective for simple panning shots. However, don't expect the kind of witchcraft you see from Panasonic or Apple. I would not use this to try to recreate a gimbal shot. I imagine it'll be much more effective for video when operated with a properly rigged camera that would add some weight to it.
And now, as the end of this video draws near, there remains but one question. Does this replace a full frame camera? And is this the true hybrid beast that I've finally been praying for? And I think, I think the answer is a very resounding yes. So for any type of like real long form documentary work where I'm shooting a lot of interviews, I think I would still prefer to use the cannons. If I'm trying to prioritize traveling light and just reducing the amount of decisions that I have to make, especially for travel work, I'm definitely just taking the Fuji and I'm really tempted to sell these Canon cameras now and just have that cash right back in my pocket. This is making it really hard to justify keeping two systems. And so I really have to really think about, is it worth just having so much cash invested into so many different camera bodies and lenses? That's a personal financial decision that I'm gonna have to come to terms with eventually. For everyone else out there, I would say that yes, you can sell your full frame kit unless you are the type of photographer that needs the absolute most critical, I cannot miss this shot focus and buffer. This is an anomaly. This is, this is like LeBron James, right? He's six foot nine, 260 pounds, and he moves like a gazelle and he can jump out of the gym and you just look at him and you're like, people that big should not move like that. How is this possible? And that is how I feel looking at this camera is how is this possible? How is such a large sensor with so much resolution? How does it feel and act? How is it possible that it feels like I'm shooting on a Canon R5? Even just holding it feels so good in the hand. It's such a tactile experience. Even the, the aesthetic design is so beautiful, which is something that I know has nothing to do with the shooting experience, but it's something that I can still appreciate significantly. And I, I love shooting on this camera. This is actually, this camera actually gives me joy to use. It's very similar to how I feel about my X-Pro3, which is a camera that isn't the best image quality, and it's not the fastest, and it doesn't have the best autofocus, but it's it provides such a fun shooting experience it's, because it's so small, and I have such a small lens on it, I can just kind of pick it up and take it places where I normally wouldn't take my, my large kit. And it forces me to use a different side of my brain and I really enjoy shooting with it. And this camera gives me a very similar positive experience. Like, and the reason that this video is taking so long is because I keep finding excuses to go out and shoot more shit with it because I want to shoot with it. And that is an added benefit of the camera because the best camera is always the one that you have with you. And if you have a camera that you actually want to shoot with, you're going to get more practice. You're going to get more repetitions. You're going to get more images that you're happy with because you're going to take it out more. You're going to feel compelled to bring it with you. And yeah, there's no point in having a camera, especially one that's so expensive, if it's going to stay locked up in a safe most of the time. So thank you so much for this first impressions. I know it's kind of all over the place, but there was a lot of stuff to cover. If you want to continue this conversation, please leave a comment, follow me on Instagram like, and subscribe, because it'll really help me. And once again, thank you. I'll see you on the next one.